thanks very much. So uh, I guess I can go now. I already got my. So like um, every single person in this room, I have some superpower and a lot of passions. But one of these is that uh, I can draw a little bit, right? So. I'll, uh, I'll treat you, I guess, with a little bit of uh, stories and cartoons and whatever. So let's start with a story that probably you all know, which is this one. Once upon a time, there was a speedy hare who boasted about how fast he could run. And tired of all this nonsense, a tortoise called Slow and Steady decided to challenge the hare for a race. What? A race? I'm so fast, you will never win. So anyways, off they go. The morning after, it was a really early morning, they start the race. And of course the hare like, starts really, really quick and creates like a big distance pretty much with the tortoise. And, uh, and then of course what happened was, it was early in the morning, oh I didn't have breakfast, and so he says, how about we have my large breakfast and then Let's sleep for a little bit, okay, a little nap. And then of course we know how the story ends, right? That the tortoise walks and walks, and in the end wins the race. And from that moment on, the hare would say and remind to herself or himself, don't brag about your lighting pace, for slow and steady won the race, okay? So instead, now it turns out that the tortoise is a symbol of the relentless uh, effort of true lean organizations, right? When we look at lean, we, sometimes we, re we refer to Toyota as the, the tortoise, really. So we look at that in terms of continuous improvement, plan do, study adjust, or plan do, check act, if you prefer. It's really like go slow to go fast, right? We take our time, we investigate and we do this, it's about lean and systems thinking. It's about understanding and reducing complexity. It's about evidence-based, scientific thinking. It's about putting up an investigator's hat, right? We have a problem, we investigate, we take our time. And uh, it's about being easier, better, faster, and cheaper in that order, okay? According to Shingo, in that order. But hold on for a second, okay? So Houston, here we have a problem. And the problem is, as Jack Welch actually used to say, if the rate of change on the outside is faster than the rate of change on the inside, what happens? The end is near. <laughs> okay, and unfortunately what happens is that organizations, they think they're changing, but they don't change really much, right? What happens is it starts from the organizational chart, which I call the blame flow. It starts from the very top with God. It goes down to the rule makers, the controllers, the enforcers, who's left? The losers, right? So, so there we go. But the point is that to me, they're all victims. We are all victims of a system. This is what we learn at school. This is what we, we see when we enter our first organizations, right? If you become a manager, essentially you're expected to tell people what to do. This is what we watch on television as well, right? If you have The Apprentice, yeah? There's an autocratic, let's call him leader, or whatever, who actually tells you're fired because you weren't good enough. And for me to win, everybody else needs to lose. Scarcity mentality. Okay, so uh, meanwhile, what's happening? It happens that technology and society move faster than most companies' ability to adapt. Uh, I was in Spotify, like, uh, recently, and uh, let's look at this. New knowledge discovery, legal regulatory change, new technology developments, new trends, and so on. Do you think they are resilient to that? Those are threats that come from everywhere. Even if we take those big examples, the threats come from everywhere. Nobody's safe. Everyone is in trouble, including the wise lean turtles. Okay, so I wonder how can organizations move fast, learn faster, and thrive in the current marketplace? How? So let's see, you see, the problem is that we want to improve, but improvement without change is impossible. It's kind of a self evident thing, right? But uh, I like to, uh, and who says it? I say it. I like to quote myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. 
That is so fabulous. To be honest, like, it, it, yeah, there we go. In the past, I didn't even quote myself. I like to quote myself, but this is so self-evident, right? Well, so the thing is, like, see, the problem is, most of us, you know, we think about change as big, slow, and scary. You know, this is Godzilla. Okay, it's, it's, you know, it's massive. And then so we start about saying, oh, we need to manage change. We need to handle risk. And there's all this kind of idea. But what if instead of looking at this kind of big, huge change, we looked at the infinite small? What if you make it really, really small? In fact, look at microorganisms, viruses, and essentially learn to evolve fast, almost as fast as a virus. There are some microorganisms, some of the most adaptive creatures on Earth. They have a new generation every 15 minutes. They evolve so fast that whatever drug you try, change, 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 some of it is actually, let's call it improvement or adapt uh, adaptation to that kind of drugs. And there's no drug on earth that actually works. It becomes really, really expensive to kill these damn bastards. Okay, so how do we do this? So, so, so that's a thing, okay, seriously, are you looking at us? Okay, so here's a mad thought. It can't possibly work, right? Popcorn flow principle number one. If change is hard, make it continuous. Which, for developers out here, shouldn't be that mad, right? It shouldn't be that difficult. Because we're to, if we're talking about continuous integration, yeah, do you remember what it was like before we had continuous integration? We integrated at the very end, right? It was a bloodbath. So we learned that by doing that continuously, we could get fast feedback. We don't, we don't introduce so much change. We have less likelihood to introduce bugs. We get the feedback really fast. Why don't we do it with change? Why? It seems self-evident to me. Okay, but, and so when I started actually thinking about that, I said, okay, I want to try to pull the knob to 10, right? I remember Ken back on extreme programming, he, has this, he used this metaphor, right? And saying, let's pull the knobs to 10 and actually see what happens. And then somebody said, oh yeah, only to 10? You haven't seen Spinal Tap? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's go to 11. And then I said, why just Spinal Tap? Let's go to 12. So this is Popcorn Flow. How, how extreme can we be on this? Okay, so, um, and that's essentially all you need. I can go home now, yeah? If you apply this a lot, that's it. I don't, you don't need me. However, trying to rewire the human brain, of course, is difficult. And so a better option is to add on the systems. Yeah, so essentially the way, the creating the environment in this particular case in which decisions are made. Okay, so instead of trying to change people's mindset, behavior, rewiring, and whatever, let's start on the system so that allows people to evolve through it. The question is, of course, how? How do we do this? So, a while ago, I worked with a team who had not deployed software in months, and that was a big, big issue. Uh, in fact, the company was in crisis also because of that. And so, with the motto, hard on systems and soft on people, which is a Toyota approach, the idea there is that if we believe that in order to enable people to grow, we need to, or what we do, our productivity, our ability to produce stuff is a result of the systems that we use, then let's blame the systems. No, let's not blame people, right? Our different uh, level of variation, essentially, on how we produce, it's, it's really influenced, like, big time, affected by the environment in which we are on. So let's blame the system, not people. So anyways, we use the Kanban method to, to evolve. But the real secret, and you see, the Kanban board, you know, typically, like, you go there, you see Kanban boards, you see screen boards, and it reminds me of that story where the journalist goes there and says, why do you allow all your Americans your American competitors to steal all your tools. Yeah, to come here, visit, and steal all your tools. And the manager, urban legend, of course, but said what they need to see is not visible. That's the outcome of their thinking, not the thinking. <laughs> so you see, like in this case, the common board is the outcome of our thinking, not our thinking. So you see, it's not what you do, but rather what you learn by doing it that matters. And again, I'm quoting myself, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the real secret for us was our rapid stream of traceable change experiments. Uh, something that starts pretty much in steps. So we start with problem and observations, options, possible experiments, committed, ongoing, review, next. Okay, we'll revisit that together, but that's, those are the steps we went through. 
The beginning of each step makes the word popcorn, hence the name popcorn flow. Okay, so, so, so let's use it. Let's see it. How do we use these steps? In this way. So uh, we capture our learning journey on a parallel popcorn flow board. So imagine to have a Kanban board, a Scrum board, whatever visual board you have to visualize how you're creating value to the customer, how you're building. Uh, uh, features, essentially your value stream. This is what I would consider is a learning stream, okay? is how we learn. So, but it's parallel in addition to that. So you see all the steps just repeated there and that's the kind of the, bur the, the board has it, how it would look like. So we start with problems and observations. So imagine we are in a software development team, just as an example. This is not just limited to software. So here's a problem that I might have in my team. The code sucks. Okay, as you see, it's a very opinionated opinion, right? So people may even disagree with that. But notice also this, right? That I actually put my name there. You see, the problem is that inertia is our enemy, our tendency to do nothing or remain unchanged. And so I'm actually prepared and happy to make progress even with imperfect information. And as a consequence, popcorn flow principle number two. Everyone, including myself, is entitled to their own opinion, but a shared opinion is a fact. Essentially is, guys, the code sucks. Do you agree? Okay, let's treat it as a fact. If we all agree, we'll treat it as a fact. You would say, oh, well, but there's bias and whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. We will experiment. We'll find out the truth by experiencing it. But in this case, what we have, and I call this the freedom principle, because it gives everybody the freedom. It's a protocol. It's not them. It's the rule of popcorn flow, if you want. is give them freedom to express their opinion, which may be wrong. Okay? And I'm using complexity thinking here. What I'm doing is probing. I'm, I'm yeah, poking. Who's the system in this case? Well, it's not the system in Lean. In Lean, typically, the system is processes, right? In complexity, it's people as well. So you are the system, and this is what I'm poking. I'm actually saying, the code sucks. Is the system, how is the system reacting to this? OK, so how do I express this? So here I have my ticket, again, my name. If we all agree, I cross my name, or I just take my icon out. OK? So now it becomes a pseudo fat, if you want. OK, then what do we do? At this point, we move next and we say, OK, based on that, what options do we have? So I use the shared observation to create illicit options. Rule of three, paraphrasing Virginia Satir, if all you have is an option, you have no option. Two, you have a dilemma, three or more, you have a world of possibilities. So what options do we have here? We could have, I don't know, test-driven development, code review, and pair programming. But of course, right, if I, even if I were to be the team lead and I said, and now, until death will separate us, we, will sh we shall use pair programming, what do you expect people to do? We're talking about a territory of extreme uncertainty. I actually don't know how people react to change. Now, there's a good probability that if I express and bring my options in this way, I would get resistance to change. But resistance, very often, is just a reflection of the stupid ways we introduce it in the first place. It's more a reflection of us, not of them. Okay, so rather than saying that, what I would say is problems in options lead to a backlog of, exp of experiments, which is, Guy, how could we perhaps explore one or more of these options? We all agreed we have this problem. We may sometimes even disagree on the options. That's not a big deal. The point is, how about we explore it um, with a little experiment. For example, Paul, you and I, how about we have this problem, we agree that the code sucks, but how about we do pair programming, but only for three days? You and I, okay? But I'll tell you what, it's only three days what you have to lose, but I'll tell you what, at the end of the three days, here's my expectation. I, let's write it like a real experiment. So the expectation is that I like it, you like it, at the end of the three days, our perception is that the code is better and that we want to continue doing that moving forward. Would you go for it? It's only three days. Two days. <laughs> One hour, for God's sake, okay? So that's the, but that's the way, you make it small, you make it so, so small that very often you would say, you know what, I'm not a strong believer in pair programming, but it's only three days, yeah, let's do it. 
very often I disagree with others, but you know, for, for a small set of, uh, for a limited amount of time or whatever, I'm going for it, okay? And what happens is that at the end of the three days, you experience something that we didn't do before. We co-evolved in many ways. So how do we write it? So here, like, here we have the, the, these are essentially directions. Here are little experiments, okay? We see like some is data that is potentially real data that we can get. Other is totally qualitative. I, I'm asking about perception. I can actually write it in advance and ask you at the end of the three days, Paul, how did it go? Did it work for you? It sucked? Great. We have maybe something to, something to learn, okay? So here you could have as actions, research, uh, some books maybe because I don't know enough, or maybe it could be the experiment was to extract new options. And the other part would be, okay, let's put a program for three days. But let's write it, as I said before, as a real experiment. So in this case, the experiment would be we pair program. The reason is code quality sucks. Remember why we are doing this. Perception is that the code is better. We like it. We want to keep doing that. Duration, three days. And here we have the review date. The review date may be the next retrospective. For example, I like to do, say, weekly retrospectives. Every week we have a set of experiments. Okay, so what do we do then? At each retrospective, we ask exactly these questions. What experiments did we agree to do? Which actually, we, what experiments did we actually do? What was the, ex uh, the expectation? What's reality? Now we have a gap. Based on that gap, what did we learn? Based on that, what are we going to do next? Okay, and it's a kata, as you see. I know it by heart because I do it absolutely all the time. Imagine each retrospective starting with these questions. Okay, so some people fear failure and they call the gap between expectation and reality frustration. It's not really an expectation because I think that in reality when we don't set anything, we are possibly missing an opportunity. So I don't call it even expectation. What we call it in complexity is anticipation. So this is what I anticipate it will happen. I'm more than open to fail. In fact, actually, you will see 40% of my own experiments fail to meet my expectations. But I learned from all of them. Paul, it didn't work. Like those three days didn't work that well. And uh, so based on, the, on what we learned, maybe on that, we can decide what to do next. And we have options all the time. We may persist the experiment because we don't know enough. We can create a new one. We may explore new options. We may create new options. We may revisit the problem in the first place because remember, we started with an opinion really, a shared opinion. So based on what we are experiencing, we are getting a different way to look at this. So we are really like, I like to think we are in a surfboard there, right? Reality is not reality. It's like the ocean. It's moving all the time. You, if we spend a lot in analyzing, the next wave is coming, and then the next one, and then a tsunami, okay? So, so you know, sometimes like Italians say, I have feet on the ground. I don't know, you say that in English as well, right? Foot on the ground, yeah? Like, meaning I'm solidly based on reality, on facts and whatever. Yeah, that's fine, except the world is not concrete. So if, you, if your feet are on the ground, the ocean is over you. Okay? <laughs> okay, so the gap between the two is called learning. Besides, you know, can you really learn if you are not prepared to fail? So I'm doing skateboarding, I'm trying to break my other knee, actually with my son. And uh, one thing you learn really quickly in skateboarding is that you cannot learn if you're not prepared to fall. Right? The only ones who never fall are the ones who are sitting on the bench, looking at their life, passing by. Everybody else is trying, falling, you get actually cherished for trying, and they are experiencing all of this. You see, it's not fail fast, fail often, which is what we use in Lean Startup, it's learn fast, learn often. Principle number three, and it's the last one, the skateboarder principle. Or the surfer one, maybe. So right from the beginning, I knew that this was different because the team could easily handle five to 10 change experiments every single week. And uh, rapidly enabling this team, you remember the team who actually could not deliver in months to deliver multiple times a week. And, uh, and then it spread, because there's nothing that is related to software development here. So other teams learned. You see, the thing is like, these boards are visible. You can see the experiments. I don't care about problems and options, to be honest. What I do keep track, though, is the experiments, the reasons behind them, 
the action. Do you remember that? So essentially what we have is a learning team and we're bringing to the surface how these teams are learning. Okay, so uh, if you've seen the movie, you know, Total Recall, the Schwarzenegger one though, no, the second one was, was brutal, uh, where they had essentially Mars. I like to call this terraforming organizations, okay, because this is like alien technology that actually brings oxygen to organizations. One thing that I noticed, I had this kind of long hypothesis a long time ago, which was the problem with, with firefighting organizations is that the ones who actually work to prevent problems are totally invisible. The only heroes in firefighting organizations are the firefighters themselves. Because of course, problems arise, they, they save the day. What happens to everybody else? Well, I'll tell you what's happening now. This everybody else have a tons of experiments. I worked with teams that actually at this point, they have 200, 250 experiments in their board. It's very visible what they're doing. Okay, so there's a, there is a new kind of hero, the right kind of hero that is emerging here. It's bringing learning to the surface. Is there anything that is related here to software development? No. Marketing. Management, how do you talk about problems instead of telling people and so on? This is spreading, okay, across the organization. So I would like you to think in terms of imagine this continuous flow of experiments to accelerate the rate of change in every corner of your organization. How far would you go? So I believe, maybe I'm late in this belief, but maybe everybody believes it, maybe not. But we are at the verge of a new revolution because we are hearing in here like this is the turtle, the systems thinking, continuous improvement, PDCA, go slow to go fast, all the stuff that I was talking about. You see, I think there's a new kind of hair, the hair that actually reflects at the end of that race and actually says, let's apply PDCA. I lost it. The world has changed. The forest is not there anymore. <laughs> and... Uh, Let's have a rematch, okay? So what do we have? Like in Lean, we have continuous improvements. Here I propose, I guess, continuous change. Change and change evolve, improve. PDCA, of course, I'm learning PDCA. Of course I'm using PDCA, but the wheel, plan do check act, plan do study adjust, just spins really, really fast. What we have as well is instead of go slow to go fast, we have go fast to learn faster. Instead of lean and system theory, or in addition to those theories, we also add complexity theories. We embed them, okay? Instead of just understanding and reducing complexity, we're looking at absorbing it. Let's, let's, we, we know the complexity exists, we know bias exists, we know a lot of stuff exists. Let's not just push it away pretending that it doesn't exist, let's embrace it. So uh, here we have evidence-based scientific thinking, all that kind of you know, uh, discussions. I actually started initially from the scientific method and trying to break it down and see what steps there are, making it simpler and whatever. But that's not it. In, uh, in complexity, we talk about subjectivity and coevolution. So do you remember principle number two? Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Opinions are a first-class citizen in popcorn flow. We're not saying the data is away. That's an important thing. Perceptions are first-class citizen. I can actually create qualitative expectations on my, on my experiments to get faster feedback. The thing is, like, we may be wrong. We may be terribly wrong, okay? But the thing is, like, we are constantly converging, and eventually we will converge to success. Okay, so we're skateboarding again, or surfing. Uh, instead of the investigator hat, where essentially we're observing a process and then we tweakle it, as I said before, in this case, it's more like the explorer, the, the surfer. People who actually practice popcorn and flow today, I call them popcorn and flow explorers. You know, yes, we talk about the experiments, but experiments are not to validate stuff, okay? It's not that we have hypotheses where, th where there's a true-false thing that we look at to validate. What we're doing is we are running experiments to explore options. So we're exploring. Because the result of that is, is multifaceted. It's not a yes-no answer, okay? 
And finally, what we have, instead of easier, better, faster, and cheaper, yeah, maybe that, what we're looking at is different. Yeah, is evolve and disrupt. Okay, so uh, today, Popcorn Flow is entering more organizations. It, uh, it was designed pretty much to quickly introduce, sustain, and accelerate change. That's essentially how I use it first. Now, I use it with a lot of startups as well, and we'll see that in a minute. But, but then I wondered, uh, uh, what jobs are other people hiring Popcorn Flow for? Because after all, uh, as Professor Clay, um, Clayton Christensen essentially says, there's this jobs to be done theory. Essentially what we talk about is the following, is that people encounter situations that drive the need to accomplish a job, and what they're doing is they hire and fire a product and service to get the job done. Okay, so it's the job that we analyze. So I know why I build it, what I don't, what I don't know is how people are hiring it. Why are they hiring it? What are they hiring it for? Okay? So, and that's true for any product. Okay? We know why we build it, how people are using it, what kind of job are they trying to address, what's poorly served by the market, and so on. So, okay, so a very common uh, use, for example, for this is to uh, hire Park and Flow just to do better retrospectives, essentially to improve the way they work. This is a real uh, uh, board where they have here like a Kanban board. In this case, instead of having separate boards as I normally would have used, this team essentially what they do is they have a Kanban board on top and they have a pop and flow board at the bottom. They make observations on the Kanban board. Based on those observations, they change. Okay? So in this case, it's literally what you would use like in retrospectives, which is you observe, you analyze the way you work, and then you, you begin essentially to, to change it. Okay, so in this case, they do it actually, in this case, just in time, they actually add five minutes to their stand-up meeting. And they look at current experiments. In my case, and I worked a lot, I could experiment in the other way, but essentially we do weekly retrospectives. Every single week, that's the way we do it. I know a lot of people try to find new formats for retrospectives because they think they, could, they get bored. Maybe the reason is that they don't work. This one works <laughs> in a sense that you do the retrospective, you have a bunch of experiments pretty much to run. By the way, who was at the workshop yesterday? Awesome guys. So what happened at the workshop was we got in an hour, 20 minutes, 47 experiments designed, 20 committed. So on Monday, I expect people like to launch experiments. I also run an experiment that I designed pretty much on the airplane, which was uh, to create a form for you guys to give me feedback, which I can even publish, right? But the thing is, like, I wanted your email. It wasn't so much for the feedback. I wanted your email so that in a couple, one, I bribed you, right? I said, here's the cards that we use for the activities. I will pay my own money to ship it to you. But what I'll do, in addition to that, is in two weeks' time, I will call you back and say, how did the experiments go? Okay? Because the reason is, I, I care about this, and I care that you are successful in doing this. Okay? So it's a form of, if you want, accountability. Okay? Or at least to help you out, like in any, in any form of possible. So, but I run experiments all the time, and this was just one. And thank Paul, by the way, because he actually printed everything on the last minute. I think the workshop already started before we had the form ready or, or close to it. In any case, so that's the way. Uh, some managers actually hire Park and Flow to reach wider consensus and take better decisions. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. Like in very stuffy organizations, I've seen that a lot, where uh, project managers, for example, would tell people what to do. They, they all come in this way. But because we're making it really, really visible, they switch into from the tell mode to the sell mode. Here's the problem, what options do we have? Or they, they come up and they co-design essentially strategies there. Okay, so it's a really, because it's simple. From, from this point of view, it's very simple. You can go down in the theory and you know, the, the, the hole goes down like uh, as much as it went. But it's very visual, it's very simple, simple steps and whatever. So I can even go to a board, not teaching popcorn flow to anybody, just do a retrospective by just starting uh, creating columns like that. Yeah? So what's the problem? Here's another thing for coaching and mentoring is that, you know, some of us, maybe if, they're, if you're also like lean and agile coaches and whatever, sometimes you get people who 
resist, right, to the idea of lean and agile. But that's, that's the solution. And I always say, OK, but what's the problem? Not my problem, your problem. What problems do you have? So we start with those ones. OK? So um, corporate boardrooms, actually, some of them now, uh, they use it for strategic decision making. So in this particular case, is this idea of instead of calling them options, we call them strategies. And what you have is instead of committing to a potentially dangerous strategy, we commit to experiments instead. So you're delaying the choice, right? Delaying commitment, which is a real option. Uh, are you familiar with real options from Chris Matz and Olaf? Some of you. OK, so real options is essentially a theory that comes from, from uh, the financial world. It's kind of an observation. There's two observations and a strategy, I guess. The observation one is that options have value, so people are prepared to pay for it. Imagine Ryanair flights, you get, you get maybe an invite to go, I don't know, to Scotland in a particular day. I don't know if I even want to go to Scotland, but maybe I'm willing to pay for the option to go there. And so I pay for that option. But options expire. If I don't decide early enough, then that, that offer perhaps expires. And it's the same if I want to go somewhere, what kind of uh, method I use to go there and so on. Uh, but the strategy is never commit to an option unless you know why. So we are delaying the commitment. So one very deliberate way here to look at options is to look in terms of if I, if I explore this option, can I keep the other ones open? So you're delaying that kind of commitment. How? By committing to experiments instead. Others, including myself, use it instead to reach product market fit and I'll learn a competition. So if you're in a startup or in a team effectively that is acting as a startup, even within a larger organization, but maybe in a new market or whatever, so typical startup, what you would have is that you have a customer and a product. Except the product is crap and you don't have customers, right? So how do we, <laughs> so how do, we do this? Uh, well, the first thing, the worst thing you can do essentially is to pay for advertisement and get everybody right, to reach your product. So the very first thing is you focus on activation. You know, the 10 or even less customers that get to, say, my page, you know, whatever. What do they do? Do they do something with it? Do they activate? Do they use it? Do they go to this other page and so on? Uh, so the first part you would look into is activation. So imagine the kind of problems. How can I improve the activation rate from X percent to Y percent? OK? Um, the, the thing is like, of course, if you focus too early on acquisition and this product is bad, what you have is a bucket full of holes, right? And you pour water in it, you pay a million of advertisements to get tons of customers in, they get their very first experience and then they run out. So you need to tweak and learn on the product before you get the masses, okay? So that's the way you do it. It's like you focus on activation, you focus on retention, do they come back? So again, you can have popcorn flow problems when you say what options do we have there? Uh, you look at, do they tell others? Are they referring to others? OK, so once you have these three components put really, really well, what you have is a sticky product. People come in, they stay with it. They experience it. They talk to others. There's maybe even virality put in there. And it's only then that you focus on acquisition to get, to get more customers. So if I know that, that the lifetime value of this is high, I can actually invest a lot more here. If I know that this is really used, I can start investing more in here then in the end you make revenue. If you start too early, say you get investment too early and you have investors who typically investors focus is growth. So if you get them too early, they're going to kill you. Okay, because our rate of learning is different. What we want to get out of this in our project is different from their goal. So once you get instead this sticky, then we have our goals aligned and that's the way you go. Okay. So, uh, Popcorn flow is touching lives even outside the business world. Uh, for example, families. This is my son. He was five. He's now six and a half. And this is his first popcorn flow board. It was kind of... Uh, now, actually, it turns out uh, I did a simplified version. There's a YouTube video somewhere, <laughs> which actually where he explains it. He explains and said, guys, okay, so this is popcorn flow stage one, okay? And then stage one, essentially, what he has... What he had, now he's on stage two. It was essentially problems, options, ongoing, done. He drew, he designed it, we did it together, okay? 
And there's a video there that explains. Problems are sometimes totally made up. What can we do with, uh, I don't know, with a bottle of water? Free games we can create with that. Or things like, uh, we have a video as well where essentially he's bored. He doesn't know what to build in Minecraft. And so we come up with options on how to do this. Uh, but one day, for example, he came and he found an acorn. And his problem was, I want to grow a tree. Okay, in the garden. Our garden is not that big, but anyway, that was the scene. And the thing is, he doesn't know how. That's a popcorn flow problem. Okay, so what options do we have? So I came up, with, I had something like, you know what, let's just do it. Okay, Nike approach, right? So you dig a hole, put the acorn in, fill it, put some water and pray, right? On, on our knee, that's, that's what we do. Um, option number two, uh, Mami was there. Mami said, how about we call Sarah? Sarah knows, is a friend of ours. She knows everything about gardening, okay? And uh, for sure, like, she would have an answer on how to do this. Option number three was, uh, um, how about we go to the library? You know, I'm sure there's some books that will tell us. In the end, we went with uh, Matteo's option, which was, let's just Google it. <laughs> Essentially, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so now, uh, yeah, so, so the thing is, like I said, okay, okay, but let's make it an experiment, okay? This wasn't stage one, it was like the entire board, and I said, okay, let's make it an experiment. The experiment would, would, could be that if we Google it, we'll find a video, okay? And within the first 10 minutes, we will find how to actually to plant this seed. And, and so we did, okay, we said we went for it. Uh, we saw the video, and the first video, the first thing that showed was that before you do anything, you need to check if the acorn is good at all. And, uh, and a really simple way to do it is that you fill a glass full of water, and you put the acorn in. If the acorn floats, it means that it's damaged. Maybe it's, there's a bug, we eat it inside, or it's damaged in some way. And so we said, okay, let's try it. So that's what we did. We put the acorn on the glass full of water, and of course, it floated. So like, it started like crying, like whatever. And, and you know, like it was, I said, okay, 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 but let's review this, okay? So, so what, we did, what did we learn was something incredible that really, really quickly, we could actually find that the acorn wasn't good at all. If we were going with my option, we would still be praying for the next nine months, okay? So, but that's really, so, so, so he understood that. And so based on that, what are we going to do next? Well, we had a couple of options on top of our heads. One was that actually we take, we grab more acorns and we test them all. The other part was actually we went back to the place where we found the first acorn with a glass full of water to try it all. Now, the, the last part of the story that you don't need to hear is that it was the wrong season, so they were all, <laughs> they were all bad, okay? But, but you know what I mean? So, like, by doing this experimentation, even from experience that you fail, very often you learn. In fact, it's actually when things don't work that we, ask, we begin to ask questions. Oh, it didn't work. Why? Yeah, thinking is driven by questions, not answers. Okay? So, so families wasn't impressive enough. There's families all around the world, by the way. Okay? Here's another one. But actually, it had two things. One was the next one now, uh, in a minute, is uh, this family actually, uh, I got an email. I get stories all the time. And uh, one of these stories was, um, so this father actually tells me, yeah, we've been using popcorn flow. And uh, so we use it, for example, to, we have three teenagers. And so for one, actually, we use one of the problems was our daughter had problems at school, in some of her subjects. So we came up with options. And, and it was about like waking up earlier and setting a stage. And apparently now she's fine. The other part, the other problem was uh, improving their life, improving the life of their bored guinea pig. <laughs> Okay, so the guinea pig was bored, and this is what they come up with, okay? So here they're doing, this is essentially the Pajon Flow stage that they're doing, and they come, these are stickers I, you know, they use and whatever. They created a seesaw for the guinea pig with, with cardboard, okay? But then they made the observation, so they put it in, they made that observation, and unfortunately I didn't have the, the I guess the release, the, the photo release of the guinea pig itself, but uh, anyway, the, the thing is like, the, what they observed was that they have actually, turns out, a shy guinea pig. So the guinea pig actually came 
behind, right? It wasn't actually using it. So they came up with another idea, which was essentially to cover this in this way, and then I was told that the guinea pig really appreciates it. <laughs> okay? But you see like how much creativity is coming. Then of course, I'm entering schools. Yeah. So there's a first school in Ireland where we're trying this stuff. And um, to me, it's, like, it's kind of uh, amazing like, to see how these things are spreading. Okay? Because to me, it's a bit like, like Toyota. You know, like in Toyota, they have the Toyota production system. They quickly realized that in order to, to be successful, they had to make the entire chain successful. And the chain comes from their suppliers, which, by the way, I'm also doing. If somebody is partnering with me these days, I'm actually teaching them rapid experimentation. You're selling workshops. Do you want people to sell more workshops? The goals are very clear. You want 20, 25 people or more paying people to your workshops, right? So the thing is like, you may decide to work with, with organizations who just put the name and so they use your brand or whatever, or you have them to get there. So these are marketing experiments effectively that people do over time, okay? But what, in order to be you successful, you partner with others to have them. <laughs> but then you go back to schools. And, uh, and then for schools is uh, three months ago, I was in Ireland, I was in the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Italian, I live in Ireland. Uh, I was in the House of Parliament. Okay, there's a proposal, an innovation for the public sector. That will never work. <laughs> okay. We see, we're, we're taking the world over. At least at this stage now with, with the new T-shirt, whatever, it's a disaster. But anyways, that for sure doesn't work. And uh, it's recorded, so I can't tell you stories about of what I've seen, but let's, let's, let's move on. Okay? Um, you see, like, Pop from Flow is also getting traction at personal level. This is, a, for example, a friend of mine. He's doing running. I don't know what he's doing, really. I know he wrote an article, but apparently his pop and flow is motivating him to run even more. And uh, every single week, like, he would send me like a tweet and say, I run 50 kilometers, 44 kilometers, and stuff like that. Um, this scares me a little bit, I must be honest, because the last time he said I run like a thousand kilometers so far using Popcorn Flow, another Popcorn Flow successful story. And to me, like if he gets a heart attack, it will be my fault, right? So, <laughs> so I'm a bit, uh, I'm not quite sure. And, uh, but it is indeed a, a way of life. It is becoming a way of life, certainly for me. Um, every single week, it's not always true, but every single week, so I'm already telling a lie because it's not every single week. But let's say most weeks. I'm five experiments older. In fact, I talked to a, to a CEO once and uh, he was really impressed by uh, some of their suppliers who happened to be my clients and wanted to meet me. And I said, you don't understand. Every single week, I'm five experiments older than you. <laughs> yeah? When you die, how old do you want to be? Two experiments old or 20,000? Right? That's the mindset, okay? It's becoming a way of life. Now, this is a very old, very old graph, but essentially this is, this is not features built. This is the rate of experiments. It's a burn-off chart. I call it a learning stream. What I find interesting about this is the rate is actually pretty okay still, which is this is it, uh, it, meet what I, it met what I anticipated, and this failed to meet my own expectations, in a way or the other, my own anticipation. It's 40%, so I laugh very often. I say, you know what? 40% of the time, I fail to meet my own expectations. So what? It's like the acorn. I'm learning all the time. And uh, so, so I'm working, sorry, I'm working on many projects and initiatives. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, including actually right now, I'm developing uh, with a friend actually a, an electronic board for distributed teams, but also to clean up like the boards as we move forward. The session is to have a really good experiment work to work for. And, uh, and finally, what we have, uh, what I'm working on, and, and actually next week, when I'm coming back, I'm going tomorrow, I'm going to Italy, then when I'm back, we have um, the first company we are on board in, just to try this, because how do we do that? Well, there's a minimum viable project, uh, uh, product, very often what they say is, uh, if you're not ashamed of your first release, you waited for too long, right? So, so that's the thing, like it kind, of, it kind of works. You know, I can use it at a personal level, and there's an extra couple of things that we are adding, but it's, it's still far from the vision. But the thing is, like, what you do is you work with one client, 
to test it, to try it, to get the experience, and then you, you do it with somebody else, and then essentially you iterate, you iterate, you iterate, until essentially paying for it becomes fair. And, uh, and finally, what I have is a book, okay, which is coming. That's the slowest part. This is what is taking a... a yeah, no, I know, this is... It's fine. 15 minutes, correct? Yes? Still? Less? Less, okay. Uh, final thoughts. It's okay? Okay, I'm a bit early, okay, so if you have questions, that's fine. Um, final thoughts are the following. Uh, all the time, and even here, we talk about ideas, we talk about change, we talk about innovation. And then, and then there's them. They're out there, right? They don't come to these conferences. Um, they don't like change, right? They like their own routines. Their own, uh, their, you know, their, yeah, their own habits. They go back to what is familiar. But you, can, you may consider that more often than not, them, it's us. We are stuck to what is familiar to us. We are stuck to our routines. We create boxes for ourselves and for others. We, we really are, very often, you know, we are almost like a byproduct of the conferences we choose to come and the ones we choose not to go to, the, the networks we, we hang around and so on. Meanwhile, everything is on the move. Everything is on the move. As I said before, it's like the ocean. But in fact, I was talking to, to my son, actually, that was last year. He was all into space, okay? And, uh, and so I was explaining, yeah, we have, you know, Earth is rotating around the sun. The sun is rotating around the galaxy. The galaxy is going at, uh, in fact, actually, we're all moving right now. As I'm speaking, at, I think it's 1.4 kilometers an hour or something like that towards Andromeda, okay? Another galaxy. So apparently, probably all the numbers are wrong, but I'm just making it up on the fly. The, the thing is like in 40 billion years, that's what I said, in 40 billion years, we will crash against Andromeda. And my son was terrified by this, okay, terrified. Um, and, uh, and I said, don't, 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 be, don't be scared because only in four billion years, like the sun will become a supernova. We'll, we'll burn in hell a lot earlier than that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, but the thing is like, everything is on the move. And, and then you have something like Popcorn Flow. You see, like, um, actually, Mary, like you talked about Brett, uh, you showed actually a video from Brett uh, Victor. It's an amazing video, okay? And uh, to me, like, that's, that's amazing. What you just showed is amazing. But I think you both agree that perhaps one of the most amazing things is how he ends it is essentially the principle that is actually driving all of this, okay? So he's got the principle that you try to capture. And, uh, and I found this, I, I, you know, I said, okay, so what's mine? What's my cause? Okay, because, be, because this is what I, like, like most of you, I think, um, I, I follow this path, and Brett actually talks about this. It's the path, it's, it's our path. How do we grow? What, what path do we choose? And the first path is, is the path of the craftsman. I've been a craftsman for pretty much all, most of my life, okay? I've been launching like uh, co, co launching like the Dublin Alternate user group, essentially an equivalent of craftsmanship today. Uh, so craftsman, you want to do a good job, you want to care about your craft and you build it and so on. But then, you know, um, actually I was a chief technology officer for a company at some point. We were the new company of the year in 2005. In a very lean and agile way, we went out of business. And, uh, <laughs> and the thing is like, so you learn sort of that operational excellence is not enough, right? So we, we had opinions, we went, just went in the wrong direction. We didn't have the right models to experiment and to, to verify our hypotheses in a way or to explore them in a, in a good way. But so anyways, like I wonder for at least three years, like to understand, because I was asked this question by CIO, C CIO. That's, that's when I became a consultant, by the way, right? So, uh, so, so, so I became a consultant. First mission, CIO asked me, if you were so smart, why did you fail? For three years, I asked myself that question since then. What, what happened? What went wrong? And so, but anyways, like I got into entrepreneurship 
uh, more exposed to entrepreneurship, particularly lean startup. And, uh, and, and with lean startup, I understood what we were talking about here. It was a territory of extreme uncertainty, okay? And that's what went wrong. That I couldn't understand where we are, in what, where we were moving. And finally, the other aspect was, as an entrepreneur, there's a different path. So I moved from the perfectionists, uh, uh, as I said before, craftsmen and so whatever, to another path, which is the path of entrepreneurship. Path of entrepreneurship is actually the path of the problem solver. You understand that somebody's problem is somebody else's opportunity. Okay? So I worked on that and I built tools. And then I realized things like that. How are people, what job are they using these tools for? And so I built things for certain things and then I discovered that uh, so I, I created, for example, a problem-solving tool that, uh, based on a Toyota methodology, which I sold back to Toyota. So I sold ice cream to the Eskimo, like in a way. And Nissan North America, Lockheed Martin, you know, like big companies and also small companies. But then I discovered that these tools were used by social activists in South Africa and North America to fight things like, I don't know, uh, poverty and uh, racism. Okay? So that brought me to a third path. And I'm not saying that one is more valuable than the other. It's more like paths that you can consider, options. Which is the path of uh, activism by invention. And it's this idea that we can create stuff to for, and fight for a cause, whatever that cause is. Yeah? And in that particular case, in my, in my case, I, I find and I fight that all the time what we see is inertia all around. You know, I kind of mentioned that there. This inertia, but inertia is not just our personal inertia. I think it's a planetary issue because it's inertia of others as well. In fact, we are victims of others' inertia, and we can see that every time we, we don't make choices, we sleepwalk, we go and we, we accept systems as they are. And you see, most of the systems that we face are not systems like the ones I was talking about, you know, Earth moving to Andromeda. They're not natural. Uh, cosmic laws. A lot of these roles, a lot of these systems have been created by humans and by humans shall be destroyed. Okay? So, so that's what I personally am fighting for is inertia. Okay? So think about park and floor, think about all the systems you see, all the things that you think are impossible to solve and one day we won't consider things like, I don't know, poverty and, and racism as they just are, or diversity, okay? Okay, with this I want to just uh, say the last thing, the world needs to be changed. We all agree with that, but the world needs you to change. Thank you. Sorry, can I just say just one thing? Just one more thing? Uh, you <laughs> just one more, just one more, just a quick one, which is, you remember what I said before, right? It's not what you do, but rather what you learn by doing it that matters. Well, that's only half of the story, because then it's not what you learn, but what you do with what you learn that matters, okay? So take all the information you get from this session, but as well for everything that you learned before, and act on it. Thank you.